All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hyperledger Special Interest Group for Healthcare. Uh, my name is Ray Dogum. I'm the chair of this uh, group. And typically, we talk about industry updates, developments, anything that's related to healthcare and blockchain, and also for Hyperledger as well. So welcome. Um, if there's anybody on here who's new and would like to introduce themselves, I would just like to remind you that the recordings here are, re are uh, posted on YouTube. So just be, be careful what you say, I guess, and especially if it's related to anything uh, confidential from your company. So any, would anyone like to introduce themselves today? All right. Uh, does anyone have any announcements for the membership here related to the last few weeks or any job openings or questions, any interests? What would you like to get out of this? Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to dive into uh, the upcoming events for this month, next month, and the rest of the year. So on August 29th in Stanford, there's the Science of Blockchain event. You can access that here. And by the way, this agenda is posted for everyone. It is a public agenda. Um, and it's also posted in the YouTube description. So you can find that link there. An important event actually coming up is the 2022 Hyperledger Global Forum. And we do have a discount code if you are interested in attending. It is on September 12th through the 14th. There are a number of different panels, keynotes, discussions that are happening. And a few of them are related to healthcare as well. So I just pointed them out here. The Health 3.0, how a DeFi enabled tokenized data economy will reinvent healthcare and put patients first. That's one event by Heather Flannery from Equidium Health. There's a demo called Achieving Pharma Supply Chain Resilience with Blockchain uh, with Daniel Leverick and Zolig uh, from Zolig Pharma. There's a panel discussion called Best Practices from Leading Healthcare and Life Sciences Blockchain Production Deployments and Advanced Research Investigations uh, with Sophia Lopez, Kaleido, Kyle Culver from Synaptic Health Alliance and Flora Nenda from Pfizer, as well as Alan Bachman from CVS. So that should be a really interesting one. Is anyone here planning to attend the conference, the Hyperledger Global Forum next month? It's, it's close by me, but um, I, 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 unfortunately I can't, um, I'm sort of in another engagement at the moment and I can't get the time off, which is a shame because there's, you know, there's a few of those plus some of the other events I'd have, I'd have liked to come to, but yeah. Thanks, Sid, for sharing that. Um, yeah, of is course. It, is know. it going to be live? Is it live? I suppose it, I know stuff is put up on the Hyperledger channel afterwards. Um, there's no live non-in-person option, is there? Or is there for some of these? I think there might be a live okay. option for um, I'll have, attendees. I'll have, look, I'll, I'll have a look again and see yeah, I can check afterwards, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And that's a good question. Next time, next meeting, I can, if there is a link or if they are planning to live stream it, I can let the team, I'll let the membership know as well. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, September 15th, the Converge 2X Symposium in Austin, Texas will also be going on. This is a pretty um, good event as well. I think this is like the fifth, fourth or fifth year that they're doing sixth year here. So definitely check that out, especially if you're in Texas, Austin. September 23rd and 24th, the DSI Boston group is getting together for an event as well in Boston. That should be an interesting one. On November 13th through the 16th, there's a health event, H HT, um, L health, I think this is HTLH. 2022, so you can check that out. HLTH, yeah. Okay. Any other events people 
are looking forward to going to, they wanted to include on this list? Yes, hello, Ray. This is Wendy Charles. I wanted to add um, that the Government Blockchain Association is hosting a conference in Washington, D.C. at the end of September, September 29 and 30. And it's about um, blockchain and infrastructure. So mainly like enterprise level implementations. And the goal is for um, to discuss building blockchain for government. And um, like um, many of our friends will be attending and speaking and happy to see Heather Flannery and Frank Ricotta on a panel together to share updates. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, in the chat as well. Appreciate that. Oh, sorry that I was going, um, that my camera was covered. Um, good morning, everyone. Hey, Wendy, good to see you. All right, um, jumping into industry news articles and interesting projects. These are a few articles I did find over the last couple of weeks. If there are others that you would like to share as well, just add them into the chat and we can discuss them too. The first one here is from Vice News titled TikTok's parent company bought a bunch of hospitals for one and a half billion dollars. I thought this was pretty interesting because as we know, TikTok has grown significantly in the last you know, few years and has created a cultural uh, phenomenon really with video, short video. So for them to purchase hospitals, I thought was a little surprising, uh, especially this many hospitals. Uh, it's apparently the biggest deal, a biggest purchase made since Beijing's anti-monopoly crackdown on tech companies. Um, as you may know, uh, the parent company is called ByteDance. And they have full ownership of the women's and children's hospitals in cities from Beijing to Shenzhen, uh, Bloomberg reported. So I, I don't know how this will impact um, their business model or what they plan to do with it. But it is interesting to see a lot of tech companies. It's not just TikTok, but Amazon and other tech companies are really getting to the healthcare space. Um, it's a short article, but just wanted to bring this up. Any thoughts on this one? And I don't know if they're working on any blockchain developments or protocols, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if they one day uh, talk about that. So here in, on a Sophos security blog, I saw that Slack admits to leaking hashed passwords for five years. I thought this was quite alarming. Um, Slack. So from 2017 to 2022, Slack said that the data sent to the recipients of invitations included the sender's hashed password. So here, just let me take a step back and say the company admitted that it had inadvertently been oversharing personal data when users share when users created or revoked a shared invitation link for their workspaces. So as part of that, uh, their sender's hashed password was also sent. So it goes into what went wrong here. Uh, Slack security advisory doesn't explain the breach very clearly, saying merely that password was not visible to any Slack clients, discovering it required actively monitoring encrypted network traffic coming from Slack's servers. Um, so it goes into the detail of what happened here, technically speaking. Have any of you used Slack before? Is Wendy. I think all of us have from some capacity or another. Um, yeah, right. Video, yeah. Why, why don't you share your, your experiences? I think Sid was uh, talking, uh, but yes, I would agree. I think many of us in the corporate world, as well as um, for personal use, have used Slack. And that's why I thought this article was quite alarming. Um, especially if you reuse your passwords, that's especially um, important to use different passwords for different applications so that if it were to be leaked, you wouldn't be in, uh, be compromised for other accounts as well. Yeah, they sort of actively went out and um, 
if you use one of those password links, um, <laughs> which in one of my one of my um, orgs I had done, um, they actively go out, went out and said, if you use one of these, um, there's a threat that, that's been discovered. Um, this is how to do it. So yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good, um, it's a good one to highlight for sure. Absolutely. Hopefully, no one here was hacked. Um, moving on to the next article here. This is from Tech Republic: Building the Future of Healthcare in the Metaverse. Uh, published actually a couple of days ago. So they discuss, you know, everything from article artificial intelligence to augmented reality and virtual reality, and discuss how the metaverse will evolve, including that. You know, they predict by 2030, the healthcare metaverse market will grow by 48% uh, CAGR, CAGR, and uh, be worth $5.37 billion. Um, they also mentioned that many companies are driving this innovation and change, including um, Brain Lab, Novarad, GE Healthcare, Siemens Health Aneers, Meta Platforms Incorporated. Uh, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Roblox, a Game Change VR, and others. So certainly major companies are working on developing the future for the metaverse. Um, they talk about how mental health is an important uh, use case in the metaverse. And specifically they say here, um, yeah, this is an interesting statistic. Statistically, more than 800,000 people kill themselves each year in the world. And 45,000 of those individuals are in the US. Uh, comparably, comparably, the high percentage of veteran suicides remains unacceptable with over 6,000 veteran suicides in 2019. Um, so this company, 2B3D, uh, is migrating its telehealth platforms into VR into this VR medical environment. So um, this is just one example of a company doing metaverse innovation. Uh, there are other examples here as well. Um, and, you know, I think that what's interesting here is also the quality of the metaverse is something people are really working on. So, and when I say quality, I mean, the visual quality, the, the graphics, uh, the pixelation, um, because companies like unity and unreal engine and these are gaming platforms these are these have been used for you know hardcore gamers uh or gaming development so what that means is the reality of vr is becoming more and more high definition um so and i think that will drive adoption eventually because one of the you know one of the challenges for vr is that the quality is not really great so it like becomes difficult to use after a while you know you can only last 15 20 minutes in those glasses but once um they improve that i think it'll it'll change the way people adopt it uh, any thoughts on that um this is wendy i i just had um uh, well i think it's it's great progress um a big question i have is about licensing of healthcare providers do any of you know whether how they manage licensing of healthcare providers in this virtual environment and whether the an individual must declare which state they are currently residing in cuz it's great you know to develop um counseling and different uh, interventions um, for people who are in need. Um, I was just curious as to how some of the current licensing laws apply. That's a great question, Wendy. And it's also similar with, with telehealth as well, in terms of like yeah, provider licensing, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I there's know. been, um, yeah. And does anyone on the call know? I'm not sure. And I'm sure they'll have to figure that out as well. But yeah, um, for some of the earliest um, metaverse platforms, such as Second Life, which is mm -hmm. one of the first, they actually had a licensed uh, a licensed clinic, but each individual 
had to declare which state they were residing in. And they, are, they had therapists that were licensed in many states, but couldn't treat people from certain states. I would hope that as states are entering licensing compacts, um, that there could be more progress in making like mental health services and, and certain types of therapy services available without, um, I don't know. I was going to say such stringent licensing constraints, but of course we want qualified people, but I just sure. wasn't sure how it's managed. Yeah. And I, you know, I do recognize that after COVID things kind of changed mm -hmm. significantly with licensing for providers. Um, and I think it's gotten easier to get licensed in various states. However, mm -hmm. it's still a 50 state system in the United States, at least. Um, and the idea here is the patient can only be, treated by a physician in which they're currently in. So if a patient is in, um, you know, Florida, they have to be seen by a physician who is a Florida licensed provider. Um, and of course, in the metaverse, it's kind of different. It's kind of strange because you could be anywhere. Uh, so it's a fair point. Keep a lookout for that. Um, it also says here, blockchain technology is recognized for its security potential. The blockchain is decentralized and data is not uploaded to a server or stored in a single location. Uh, data in the blockchain also moves through several computers or nodes, is encrypted and validated, and is extremely hard to hack because all computers or nodes on the network must be breached simultaneously for the data to be compromised. Um, that's an interesting article. Very, It's a very high level, but um, fair enough. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on from that one, but I thought that was interesting to highlight. Just just on on that one, Ray, there was a um, there was a um, I think Oxford um, teamed up with the NHS in 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 the UK to do a sort of a VR, so not quite not the metaverse, but to do VR um, for people with psychosis. I, I, I dug up the link um, if, if it's if it's of interest. Thanks for sharing that. Game Changer VR. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's all right. Uh, yeah, but this is certainly an important space. So I think there's, it's the first time I've seen this. So this is really cool. Um, and obviously, I think it was just a, a, a UK one. So that's probably why you might have passed by. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> uh, but they have done some studies on it, so that's really great to see. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing this. I'll include it in the, the comments as well if for anyone who's interested. Cool. And maybe one day we'll all be joining meetings through VR, right? That's kind of the, the promise behind the metaverse as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Create a more engaging uh, working environment when we're all remote. Um, okay, this was an article from Politico titled Artificial Intelligence Was Supposed to Transform Healthcare. It hasn't, it's rather lengthy, uh, but I just wanted to highlight a few like graphs that I thought were, were interesting. <clears throat> so this one is about AI funding in healthcare and how it's, it's grown significantly, especially over the last few years here in 2021, there was $10 billion dollars funded for dig digital health startups that were using AI. Um, again, 2022 is not over yet. So that's subject to change here. But it doesn't seem that it'll exceed last year's. We'll see. Um, and the FDA here, it says the FDA has taken steps to develop a model for evaluating AI, but it is still in early, it, it is still in its early days. So to be to be seen how that evolves. The other interesting thing here is that's highlighting that the AI enabled companies are becoming a larger share of dig digital health funding overall. So about 35 30% of all digital health funding is going to AI enabled companies. So that's pretty significant, I think. Um,
talks about different use cases using AI and examples here, uh, including one from, you know, using AI in radiology at NYU, Lango and Health. Some of the challenges for AI. So this is interesting always. Um, the biggest barrier to the use of AI in healthcare has to do with infrastructure. So health systems need to enable algorithms to access patient data. Over the last several years, large well-funded systems have invested in moving their data into the cloud, uh, creating vast data lakes ready to be consumed by AI. But that's not easy for smaller players. And another problem is that every health system is unique in its technology and the way it treats patient. That means an algorithm may not work as well everywhere. Yeah, and it also talked about this um, independent study on a widely used sepsis detection algorithm from EHR uh, giant Epic. We all know the company Epic, and it showed poor results in real world settings, suggesting where and how hospitals use the AI mattered. So just throwing AI at it does not really solve problems. It's really a fine-tuned precision sort of surgical um, application for AI. Um, and it also me mentions how that radiology is dominating in terms of FDA approved AI enabled devices. Um, next article here is related to the Ethereum merge. So as we know, Ethereum is moving from proof of work to proof of stake, which is reducing its uh, carbon footprint significantly. Uh, this is apparently happening in September. That's the plan, uh, mid-September at some point. And you know, this is something that's been in the planning process in development for essentially almost you know years now. Um, so it's a huge milestone for the Ethereum community, and we will see how it ends up and this there's so much speculation around this uh, but there ha there have been many efforts to ensure that it's been tested thoroughly so you know proof of stake is already working on their test nets so anyone curious about the merge or working on the merge or have any thoughts or comments to share about the merge Well, I'm sure it's significant. I know that Hyperledger platforms and Hyperledger tools and applications, um, some of them that are connected to the Ethereum protocol will also have some changes as well. So there's uh, work to be done in managing that. Yeah, just to add to that, this is Mohan. Yes. Uh, they just recently did the merge on the test net, I guess, and they are uh, figuring how it is working. Um, but overall, the merge does not impact any of the application development or the developer side. It's only impacting the validators, ultimately, uh, right? I mean, essentially, they're moving to proof of stake. And really, it's impacting the validators, but they have put some controls and rules in terms of validators cannot disconnect their machines. Validators don't get access to their funds immediately, at least for now. Uh, and then that they have to run two nodes, right? Essentially the consensus node as well as the execution node. So I think they are figuring out all these things and there is a tran gradual transition towards uh, using Ethereum 2.0, which will finally become Ethereum. They'll drop the 2.0. Right, yeah, and the as you mentioned, the testnet blockchain, um, Agorli was made you know was activated on august 10th or that transition happened august right, 10th. right. recently mm -hmm. very recently sure um definitely and it seems it went okay uh the tests weren't flawless some validators went offline in each test for different reasons um, ethereum can continue to function however so long as most validators continue to remain online and no group of validators falls out of consensus so right. there is a there little bit of risk news. here. Yeah, 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 there was some random news on after the merge, uh, the value of Ethereum dropped below 1900, but it's still 7% up from whatever it was, you know, so I was trying to figure out 
out of curiosity, why did it drop? Uh, you know, what? And not that it's a significant drop, but below 1900, but it's picked up back. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, a lot of good information here. From the uh, Quidium side, I probably should know this, but I don't. Um, the what the impact on latency and cost and other things. Does anyone have a sense of what that is? I mean, do transaction fees materially drop? Does latency improve substantially? Um, yeah. proof I think the work? the blog actually on the Ethereum website has got the the myths about the Ethereum merge. So it, there's no change in the latency or whatever it is. You know, some of the questions you're asking is documented there. Uh, yeah. Change in the transaction fees. It's uh, they have a fixed price plus a tip, and that tip gives priority to transactions. And the way the validators get compensated, there's a slight change. They still get their base, but uh, they also get access to the tip and stuff like that. So, yeah, good question actually. You know, so I was also very curious. So. Yeah, I put a link to the misconceptions page in the chat as well for anyone who's interested. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks for the questions and feedback here. Um, a couple educational nuggets from the last couple of weeks. One is the DSI and idea market. I saw a sub stack related to how DSI can generate these idea markets without institutions. So basically what they're trying to do is create credibility without institutions. Um, and the way they do that is these on-chain ratings and they generate a list of people who are confident in the results of a study. So it's basically like a, seems like a voting sort of mechanism or rating really, not voting. And yeah, here it says in the same, in the same way, Substack is helping you shift trust in journalism away from institutions and towards individuals. Idea market enables credibility, credibility on all topics to follow the same pattern. It won't be long until the opinion of 100 people you trust outweighs the opinion of one institution. You don't, um, I thought that was interesting. It's also still challenging to accomplish this because it could be a hundred people that you know, um, we have to be able to trust that these hundred people are knowledgeable about the subject, um, because the institution we can currently we can rely on them to cer to a certain degree at least. Um, yeah, so I just want to put this here. It's got some information on how new income streams can be developed for DSI as well through a rating system, and. Another huge piece of news that came out was related to tornado cash and U.S. sanctions. So if you haven't heard, tornado cash, which is a protocol um, built using Ethereum smart contracts that enables users to essentially wash their Ethereum or make it so that it's hard to identify where the original Ethereum came from, it obfuscates the origin of those ETH um, through like a mixing, laundering sort of protocol. And um, obviously the government is not going to let this continue uh, without trying to stop it. So what they've done is they've shut down the website as well as arrest uh, in the Netherlands. One of the developers for Tornado Cash was arrested and so now there is a huge debate between privacy, freedom of speech, and um, protecting citizens as well on the other side. So, yeah, uh, this is going to be something that people will be talking about for a while, I think. Um, it also has a lot to do with the blockchain community overall um, in terms of yeah. censorship resistance and privacy. So... And what I've read, and please correct me if I'm wrong or if anyone has any other opinions, but what I've read is that Tornado Cash does have 
some legal standing to defend itself um, based on legal precedence uh, versus the U.S. Treasury. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the department, the U.S. Department, U.S. Treasury Department seems to be blatantly going against the prevailing law that open source software is equivalent to speech, which is protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Um, so we'll see what happens. I think the Tornado Cash DAO has been raising money or they've been um, voting on whether or not to, to appeal or to sue the U.S. Treasury. So we'll see how that all turns out. People's GitHubs have been suspended as well due to this. So interesting question here is, could Tornado Cash's hired legal team be arrested? Um, Says here, the arrest seems to be an intimidation tactic. They shot across the boat to warn other developers who write privacy oriented apps and dApps. Uh, considering that the Financial Action Task Force coordinates both anti money laundering and legislative efforts from South Korea to Panama, such expedience was to be expected. Um, and in a way, this also can apply to our health data in the future because, you know, essentially, if we believe our health data is also should be private uh, and we want to keep it that way, you know, our government's going to be okay with that. Right now, our, our data is private until the government wants that information um, for security purposes, national security purposes. So, yeah. <clears throat> and if, Okay. Um, and finally, just the Health Unchained podcast. I published the 100th episode of the podcast where I interviewed a crowdfunded cures, which is a, a DAO, and they're helping other DAOs like Vita DAO and Molecule um, develop their their models as well. So check that out if you are are interested. Uh, that's all I had for today's agenda, but if there's anything else that members here would like to share or discuss, um, did I miss any important news of the week? Are there things that you are working on that you think people should know about? Ray, congratulations on your hundredth episode. That's a huge milestone. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it's been uh, three or four years now I've been working on this podcast, so I'm pretty excited to be able to get to 100. Thank you. Couldn't do it with uh, you all listening. People give me suggestions and feedback all the time, interview this person or, or this company. So if you feel like there's a project going on that needs some attention, uh, I'd be happy to to listen to that. All right. Well, thank you all uh, for joining today. Uh, it's we're a bit early to end, but I think that's okay. Uh, any final thoughts or questions? All right, great. Well, I'll stop recording here. We'll join. Please join us in another two weeks for another meeting. And in the meantime, you know where to reach me. Uh, thank you, y'all. Have a good day. Thanks, so. Bye.